Well, good evening, folks. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Hopefully you've remained sober today. Didn't get yourself in kind of trouble yet. I've never been a drinker. I've never drank alcohol, but locally here, everybody's going nuts with it. They're dressed in green and dressed up like leprechauns and <laughs> wearing kilts and such. It's it's madness, but I hope you're all doing well. I'm doing well today. The topic of this one here tonight, when being right is no longer enough. Where are we going with this one? Where is this ride taking us? Well, one of the things that I receive a lot from students all around the world and it comes up quite frequently is how to know when to take that leap of faith to start trading with live funds or a funded account. And while I don't have a definitive this is how you know. It's more closely to the title of this Twitter space. When when you're able to read price action and you can see it and anticipate it and know what's likely to occur next, and it happens most times, and you're doing it consistently, you're not impulsively going into the charts and trying to pick the next fluctuation just because you're bored it's when you're no longer influenced about pursuing being right but that line that divides that where you no longer are satisfied with being right so when you're no longer chasing that, I need to be right, I need to be right, it's just happening by default. That is, my opinion, the clearest indication that you're probably prepared, at least the earliest stages of it. As soon as you start trading with funds or even a funded account, I'm sure you're going to have that magical experience where suddenly it really matters now. It matters if you're right. And then you start that whole process all over again, desensitizing yourself to the pursuit of being right. Now, right is all right, I guess. Wrong is not necessarily bad. Meaning that you can get into a trade, you can get into an investment idea, a setup. Everything look like it's lining up for you. And as soon as you enter the trade, something just doesn't feel right. You give it a little bit of time. And then finally, you see enough to know that what you're looking at is not a viable setup anymore. And you do what is appropriate. You abort the trade. You turn it off, close it, it's done. Whatever loss, whatever result, you accept it. That's being wrong. But that's not being wrong in a bad way. It's being right about being wrong. And many of you, like me and everyone else that's come up in this industry, in the beginning, when you're trying to do your analysis, you want your analysis to be right. Because you think that right is always profitable. No. Think about how many times you were right about the direction, but got shaken out, stopped out. Right about the trade idea, but didn't push the button. So you can be right and be wrong. So it's a matter of perspective. It's not a pursuit for you or me or anyone else that's in this industry try to tell the future with these candlesticks. It's not our endeavor to be right. Our endeavor is to be consistent, doing the same things. That's been measured, studied, and has shown to provide a probability that usually ends up in what the past has shown, but that's not indicative of the future. That's the that's that gray area. 
and you have to embrace not being right all the time and being right enough. But there's a time when you get consistent with your outlook on the marketplace, your timing, your selection, bias, all those things that they come in alignment. And when you no longer have any real concern, not that you are numb to it, because that, that's a totally different thing, but you're indifferent to it. Obviously, everyone wants to see the outcome be favorable for them. But there's this state of mind that you're going to reach, and you really won't know what this feels like until you finally get there. And I'll talk about how you get there in a few minutes. But for now, the way I identify it is when you have a trade idea that you've engaged, you're in, you're in the trade now, the market's moving around. And you are absolutely disconnected in terms of emotion or needing it to be right. And equally so, you're not worried, you're not concerned if you get stopped out. The, the second one I want to talk about first. The reason why you wouldn't be concerned about being stopped out is because you know, if you've been doing the back testing, studying, watching real-time price action with me, you can see that these things are predictable. They're based on time delivery. And these structures that come into the marketplace that present our opportunities, and it may not be an opportunity that you have identified yet. You haven't found your model, but that's okay. You'll find it. It'll come to you. But you don't worry about that outcome being unfavorable because you know that one transaction, that one idea that you're placing a laboratory experiment around, which is a speculation that you're looking for a displacement in price from where it is right now and where you believe it's going to go and limiting how far it can move against you. So that stop out, if it happens, you're not worrying about it. In fact, you're completely indifferent to it, meaning if it does stop out, no, no big deal. If it runs to your target, no big deal. It's just one transaction. It's one thing that you're doing right now that absolutely has no power over removing you from your entire career. Let's flip the script now. As much as we are not concerned about losing, having a bad result, being stopped out. We're not worrying about being right. We're not worrying about it going to our profit target. We're not worrying about doing a full pull. A full pull is whatever size position you build up, you take all of it off at your target and that's it. It's all or nothing. And while you're learning, it's important not to have that mindset. No matter who tells you otherwise, it's important for you to reward yourself incrementally. Over time, you'll know when the trades are really in your favor to do full pulls where you don't take any partials. You're just managing the trade with a stop loss. But that takes time. It also takes time getting past the point of needing to be right. Because right doesn't equate to being profitable. It sounds like it's an, it's an impossibility because, you know, if you buy and it goes up, you should have made money, right? But you know that that doesn't always work like that. You get shaken out of it, scared or stop lost, hit. But you're right. Remember? It went where you thought it was going to go. And when you're no longer looking at those moves where you were correct and where you thought the market was going to go. You had the draw on liquidity correct. The bias was correct. You knew where it was going to react to. But something didn't line up perfectly, whether you were just a little late getting in or a little too early and getting stopped out and then too afraid to get back in. Whatever the factors are, when you are no longer worried about or concerned about being right about that trade. 
you have now the mindset that's it, it's needed really to do live trading with live funds, whether it be funded or your real money. But no one's going to be able to, and I can't do this for you, but no one is going to be able to tell you the proper timing for you to take that risk on. And it is a risk. But you need to have that desensitized state of mind where you're not holding yourself to a scorecard of how many times I can be right. How many times can I avoid being wrong? And many of you, and I went through this too, you're keeping score on your emotional commitment to a trade. Now think about that. You're measuring your emotional commitment to every trade you're putting on right now when you're new. What separates the trader that thinks like that from someone that's consistently profitable? They're not holding their entire career up by the results of that one transaction. They're not leveraging so much that even if it doesn't pan out, it is insignificant in the grand scheme of things. That one thing, that one transaction, that one idea, that one decision didn't materialize in a manner that was favorable for you. But you're not worried about being right. That state of mind is what I'm getting at with this particular podcast or Twitter space. When being right is no longer enough. See, right now in the beginning, everybody wants to be right. That's your scorecard. How many times can you be right in public? How many times can you be right in your private demo trading or tape reading? And you're building this idea if you're doing it like this. You're building this idea of reporting to yourself as a scorecard or a report card on the basis of how many times you're right. When you make decisions in the average everyday life, the things that you want to see happen for you sometimes doesn't pan out like that. Something happens, traffic keeps you from getting on into work on time. You, it wasn't your fault. You made the decision, though, to leave when you did. But you didn't know that traffic jam was going to tie you up. And then you may have some kind of repercussion at work. You were heading to work. You had good intentions. You were right about doing that. But you didn't get there on time. So you missed the mark. That's no different with trading. You're going to get up. You're going to start your day, open your charts up. You're going to have a game plan. You're going to wait for the market to do specific things to line up a setup for you. And you're going to push a button. And once that button is pushed and you're in there, all control has been removed from you. The only thing you can control is the risk and how much time you stay in that trade. Everything else is out of your control. And it's interesting as a psychological experiment that all of you have the opportunity to measure yourself in. When you learn how to do what I'm teaching, it at some point becomes easy to do it in demo. You get confident that you can do it consistently. Some time in the future for you, you'll decide when being right is no longer enough. You'll want to trade. You'll want to do a funded account or you'll want to speculate with your own live funds. And when you push the button then, you don't have that blank void of, if I'm wrong, I don't lose anything. Now you have I got to be right because if I'm not right, I lose money. And now where's your mind focusing? You're worrying about the risk too much. There's a great deal of 
acceptance that's required for us to do this with real money. And that risk is unfortunately something you need to embrace. You, you can't shy away from it because if you are shy to risk, you can't do this in my funds. And a lot of people discover that they can't do it without going through some kind of growing pains. And some of that is very long and arduous. It's just daunting to get through for some of you. But you have to be prepared for that being the case for you. Because you're wrestling with wanting to be right again and not have that feeling of if I'm wrong, it doesn't hurt. That's the reason why we teach to be completely bored. You shouldn't be excited about it. If it goes to your target, okay. I mean, are you going to work every day thinking, man, look at this. I got here again on time and I get to spend all these hours again for the man. I hope he appreciates me. No, of course not. It's just something that you do. It's a routine. But you need to make your trading just like that. And the only way you can get it like that is by completely desensitizing yourself to the outcome. Making it all about, am I following the rule? Am I following the protocol? Am I managing risk impeccably? Are you doing everything to preserve capital first and foremost? Because if you're doing that and your model is rooted in sound logic and things that I've been teaching and proving that exist in price action live, you have the best opportunity for you to submit to that process. And over time, this is why it's important if you ever make the step or leap of faith in the trading with the funded account or life funds in your own brokerage account, you start with a very, very insignificant amount of money. And you go through that whole process again of desensitizing yourself. Don't make it about, I got to make a five-figure withdrawal. I got to make a $1,000 withdrawal. If you start putting time limits on your goals in something like this industry, it makes you impulsive. It, it, it ushers in fear of missing out and plain old-fashioned fear. You foster performance anxiety, and you don't realize it's going on, but you're doing it to yourself. So the reason why I teach the way I do is it gives you the best probability of finding yourself in that sweet spot mentally where you don't care what the outcome is going to be. You know what you're doing is rule-based. This is what time the market should be doing this. This is where the market should be gravitating towards. And this is the draw on liquidity. I'm submitting to that idea when I'm looking at the charts and I'm waiting for something to be a catalyst that I've been studying for months and did back testing on. I see it. It makes perfect sense to me. And I know where to place my stop. I know when I would move my stop. I know when I'm going to take my first and second, and third, if it's possible, partial. I'm also looking for the things that would negate the idea. What kills the trade idea? These are all things that you have to have understood. Just because, just because you have been consistent here and there with demo. Don't think that you are prepared to trade with a funded account or life funds. You're not. You have to be completely bored of the outcome. It's the same thing. You're doing the same thing over and over again. There's going to be a state of impatience because you'll get to this consistency stage where you can do demos and you're able to find it and do well with it. Very little drawdown. It goes to your targets and you're done. And you start forming these disciplined ideas about how many times you're going to trade per day or session. And then you're going to stop. No matter how good you feel like you're on the side of the marketplace, no matter how dialed in you feel, it's time to close and get up from the table 
take your chips, cash them in, and come back tomorrow. But that's very hard. Because being right is addictive. Being right is what everybody wants to experience all the time. And they want to feel that consistently too soon. It's something you can't obtain quickly. You have to go through a process of submitting to backtesting, studying old moves, tape reading, then demo trading. And all of that requires a great deal of patience that most of you don't have. I got patience, ICT. <laughs> I was reading some of the comments before I started this Twitter space. And some of them were saying, I just started trading using what I learned from your 2022 mentorship. I just finished the last videos and I'm going for my funded account next week. You're not ready. I don't want to take away your passion or your drive, but I do want to be a voice of reason. You are not ready. You're not. So when I talk to you and I try to give you these discussions, it's meant for you to take them under advisement. So that way it gives you the proper mindset because if without the proper mindset, it doesn't matter what my tools are suggesting in the charts, you'll do something in, incorrectly with it. And you may not have the discipline or the maturity to identify as your personal weakness and not that these concepts are failing. In the beginning, it's going to be easy for you when you don't do something right. Oh, it's this that happened to me. It's that that happened to me. It's because he didn't give me a clear idea how to use this. Well, if that's true, you should not have been taking any trades with it. You have to be completely 100% responsible. That's what a trader that's consistently profitable is. They own everything they do, the bad and the good. And they're not influenced by anything outside of them, whether it be another influencer online, another trader, somebody out there that seems to be doing better than you. And you'll develop these little mental challenges that you can be right more than someone else. And then your trading becomes a pursuit of, again, what? Being right. When being right is not what we're trying to do. It's a derivative of doing the right things, but our reasoning or the, or the catalyst for us getting in the trade is not on the basis of being able to say I'm right. I want to say that again so that way you understand what I'm referring to because it's easy to hear it and go one ear out the other. When we start trading even in demo more so when you're trading with live funds you are pursuing the pleasure the stimuli that comes with being right. That feel-good hormone that gets released. It reminds you that if this was real, you'd made that much money. And you don't want to go into your development with that mindset. Because you're pursuing the end result being on the basis of you being right. And if your focus is always about being right and not the process... What are you really doing? You're teaching yourself to adhere to something on the basis of win or fail. And now you've elevated the outcome to a level of critical. It's critical for you to be right because you won't be prepared mentally to accept the fact that that one didn't work. And every single time I blew an account, it started right then, right at that moment where I had a trade idea, I put a trade on, it looked good, and then ultimately ran against me on my stop. Okay. When I first was learning, 
it felt like the weight of the world was coming down on me. It felt like I'm afraid to take the next trade because that one didn't work out for me. And the number one reason why you're fearing to take the next trade after a losing trade is because you're wrestling with the impulsiveness to want to trade with a larger size and your conscience is telling you, don't do it. And you need to listen to it. Don't. In fact, it's better for you if you're new to just completely stop for the day. Give yourself time to process that incorrect trade result. So that way you can desensitize yourself from the pursuit of being right. Because if you're trying to do your trades with the goal in mind that I'm going to be right, it's going to go to my target. It's going to go where I said it was going to go. Versus I'm trading this model. I'm trading with this approach. And I'm submitting myself. To this very thing here. Nothing else. I'm not bringing anything else into it. I'm not letting anyone else in influence my following of this logic. Come hell or high water, whatever the results are, I'm going to log it. And then I'm going to follow that model again when the setup forms it again. Whether it be later today or another day. And you will find that you will get to this point where... No longer are you pursuing being right because it's no longer enough. It's not going to be satisfying for you to just be right. You're going to be looking to do what? Be more precise, more accurate, less drawdown, less heat on your trades when you put them on. More confident to hold for not your first normal first scale out profit. Your first profit now would be your typical second partial. That's how you graduate into that point of holding for a full pull. You just can't quit cold turkey and say, okay, uh, I'm not going to do any partials anymore. I'm just going to go straight in and get all my targets. And then what happens is, invariably, you're going to have trades where you, and this is for you, um, Pat. I, I, so I watch your streams and I hear how you wrestle with you when you want to put a runner on and you, you, you you're met with this and the way you overcome and get over, get over it and power through it is you don't worry about the result. Okay. When, when you're live streaming, you're, you're talking about what you endured and you're amplifying that. And it may be entertaining. It may be for you to discharge it, vent, and you think they're releasing it, but your subconscious is holding on to it. And once that happens and it's anchored to your subconscious, it'll have an impact on your next trade. You'll see the trade. You think, okay, I'm going to hold for that 20 handle run. But what happens is when you get to that first five or 10, that little voice inside you says, remember when we held for this the last time? Do you remember what it felt like when it didn't, let us get our full target, but we had 19 handles. We didn't get to 20. Right now you have 10. And you're going to be thinking, like a deer in headlights, what do I do? What do I do? Because if I'm wrong by not getting out right now, I'm going to regret that. It's going to be more remorse. But if I hold, and it moves to my profit objective, then I'm I'm right. I'm right. Damn it, I'm right. I did what I was supposed to do. It went to my target. I'm done. I did it. I slayed it. But even if it gets to that target, you're going to be remembering how painful it was to hold on to that. Because back at the first stage of you feeling that internal voice, that conscience talking to you saying, I'm a little uncomfortable right now. I'm afraid it's going to turn on me. You know what the easiest solution is right there? It's the easiest thing in the world, but you're not going to want to do it. It's going to feel like the most asinine thing to be doing at that moment. 
because everybody out there that's not profitable that doesn't show themselves executing trades but they want to give people advice <laughs> can't call anything live but they want to give you advice they'll say you have to push your edge you have to stick to convictions it's your target or nothing what I'm saying is when you get that point in a trade where you're feeling the weight of it. Oh, do I hold? What do I do? You know, what, what, should I move my stop loss? When you start worrying, if you start feeling uncomfortable and you start, it feels like you're juggling. Do I close it? Do I hold it? Do I move my stop? Do I move my stop back? Did I move it too soon? As soon as your mind enters that, at that very moment, you have lost the plot. You must, you must take half the trade off. But Michael, what if, but what if your self-doubt isn't a bad thing? It's just the fact that you have grown in your understanding and your experience and you've been here before and the trader in you is trying to listen to the analyst that's warning you, hey, we're in trouble waters right now. Yeah, it could go to our target. It could do that. But protocol says this. This is what we do. Standard operating procedure. SOPs, okay? Standard operating procedure says... When this shit starts to get deep, take something off. How much, ICT? Half. You're divorcing the trade, but you're getting something out of it. A runner's still there, but you're getting half off. Now you've banked half. If it comes back against you and stops you out at your trailed stop loss, or if you were fickle about doing anything, just keeping your stop at original, it won't take you to a loss. You're not worrying about it. But if you wrestle with that and you're in that, that troubled water area where you're thinking about being right, you have lost the plot about the trade. You don't know how to, you won't be able to realign yourself. And anybody that says, well, you can just you know, take a step out, get a cigarette break, go get a shot of liquid courage. Go to the gym and just submit to it. See whatever happens. It, what's going to happen is you're going to stress. And that stressful endeavor that you're placing yourself through, you're teaching yourself to be fearful. And it's unnecessary. You don't need to do that. The way you master yourself, the way you conquer yourself and wrangle in these concerns about being right. You remove risk because that's the underlying thing. See, it's not a matter of can it get to my target? Of course it could. It could go way beyond what you were targeting. And it could come back on your stop. And it could just consolidate where it's at. All those things are possible. But when the mind starts getting bogged down with the concerns of needing to be right, because you will punish yourself mentally if you do anything that leads to either stopped out or not getting to target. Because at that moment, here's what you don't realize, and this is what you need to be writing down in your journal. As soon as you get to that point where you're in troubled waters, and you're now taking more attention to, what do I do? What do I do? If you're asking yourself, what do I do? And it's becoming a physical, like your, your breathing increases, the rate of your inhalations. Maybe you're getting heart palpitations, feeling dizzy, feeling anxious, feeling nervous. The answer to that is take half off. And what that does, it allows your mind to reset. You've paid yourself. Who cares if it comes back and stops you out? Who cares if it fails to get to your target? You paid yourself. 
the analyst is inside of you may be picking up on things that you've learned, but you're not registering that. Because you're not able to see growth like that initially until you go through these experiments of putting to task, submitting to the process, and then getting out there and seeing how you deal with it. And the analyst inside of you that's seen these things before is trying to tell you, hey, you're not ready for this. It might go there. Yes, it might go to your full target. Absolutely. But right now, here's the standard operating procedure. As soon as we start getting nervous and we lose sight of the plot, the way we regain that clarity, take half of the position off. Okay, Michael, what, what happens if I am only holding one contract and there's no way for me to take a partial off? You close the trade. That's it. But what if... But what if it turns against you? How are you going to deal with that? You're going to beat yourself up. You know you will. And to sit here and lie and say that you wouldn't, you're fooling no one. First and foremost, you're not fooling yourself. You have to guard your mind. You have to preserve that clarity. Once you gain it and you desensitize yourself to the outcome, you're not pursuing right. You're pursuing following your model. Those rules, those rules, if they're sound in their logic, they will preserve you if you're able to listen to the analyst in you. But if that analyst is trying to warn you, it, listen, buddy, you got out of the chair and the gambler has slip seated with you. You think you're driving, but you're not. You're riding shotgun with retail Rick. And he's had a little too much to drink on St. Patty's Day. And it looks like he's aiming for the next fucking tree. So what are you going to do? Ask for the keys. You got you to gotta take that, that wheel back. How does that happen? Take half the trade off. And if you can't take a half, then you close the trade. And then you congratulate yourself. You give yourself positive self-talk that you identified that you were in troubled waters. You lost sight of what you were doing. And now it became an emotional roller coaster, which turns into a psychological arm wrestling match with you being and pursuing right. I was right. And what will happen is when you close the trade or take half off, one of two things are going to happen. It's going to stop you out and you'll feel what? Good. You'll feel good that you did that. But some of you won't feel good about that because you'll be thinking, I should have took everything off and I would have had a bigger profit. What are you doing there? Pursuing being right. Instead of saying, I took half off. It came back and stopped me out on the remaining portion, whether it was at break even or in profit matters not. You're going to go to the calculator and say, this is what I had on the trade right when I felt like that. I should have did this. That's not how you grow. That's how you poison your perspective. You create and foster anxiety, performance anxiety specifically, because you're measuring every decision and placing so much emphasis on the outcome and it needing to be right. You don't realize you're putting yourself in this mental prison. You can't, you can't work efficiently in these markets where you're constantly placing so many limitations on you. Placing all this unnecessary weight on your shoulders that you have to be right all the time. You don't have to be right. You don't have to be right. You have to follow a sound model and stick to that. And as a derivative, a default, as a consequence to doing that, you will see results. And those results need to be completely detached from emotion or psychological need, the necessity to be right. 
And it sounds hard. It sounds almost impossible right now, especially if you're new. But those of you that have gone through these experiences because you've traded with a real money or funded account. And you got out there and you realized you knew, you knew exactly what you were feeling. It was a reminder that you did this too soon. But hey, we're here now. We are here. We showed up. Now we're going to show out. And unfortunately, you end up losing your funded account or you blow your account because you'll let that one losing trade do what? Take you completely out of the game. Now you have to do something bigger, much more monumental because you have to get a feel good moment and you'll over leverage on the next trade or you won't have a stop loss on. Because you want to be right and you lose all clarity and you think that what you're doing in that next trade is going to pan out. You just have to submit to more drawdown, more time holding on to it. And what is happening is this. You are now holding on to a losing trade that you will not identify as. But you're going to be using the logic of your model, which is hold on to your runner. But because you took your eye off of the process of following that model, you're now applying part of the logic that you're using in trading, but you're holding on to the losing trade. You're submitting yourself to that trade. Even though it's warning you and telling you, the analyst is talking to you, this is wrong. You know it's wrong, but you won't close it because you're not trading for profit now. You're trading for being right. You are arm wrestling the marketplace. That's what you're doing. You want to be smart in the eyes of someone else that you're going to share this with. And you're absolutely undermining yourself. And when you do more damage or blow the account, blow the funded account, your next lost day or whatever it is that takes you out of that, you will be miserable. You'll punish yourself. You'll relive those moments over and over again. And I can relive them all when I was 20. Just like it happened yesterday. No one's going to be as hard as you are on yourself. You just aren't making it public knowledge to most of everyone that would be paying attention to you. Now, some of you make that mistake and you go on social media. Oh, this is hard. I'm, I'm always screwing up. You're inviting more people to confirm what you're feeling, which is going to do what? Anchor more weight to that negative result, which is going to do what? Create fear, anxiety, depression, and that's not how you grow. You have to know that what you're doing is not a pursuit of being right. In the moment, the very moment that you now have these impulses inside of you, that you have to prove something to yourself, or worst case, prove something to other people, You're not trading your model. You're not even trading soundly. You're gambling on the chance of you being right. You have to release all that. You have to stop doing that with your trading. You got to stop doing that with your studies. You have to submit to whatever happens. As long as you're using the processes and protocols that you've adopted as your model, you're going to accept whatever the results are because you have done enough research to know that the things that you're trying to pursue repeat not just once in a blue moon, but they repeat almost daily, if not every day. Every day, the market's going to run for some hourly Old high or an old low. This is the part where you start writing down notes, folks. Every day, there's an intraday range that has an old 60-minute high or an old 60-minute low. And between where the market is at market price, whenever you're sitting down and looking at your charts, you want to identify them because there's liquidity there. This is the surest way for you to know that you can go in there every single day 
every single day this is forming. There is not a day that this does not form. Okay? This is an everyday bread and butter logic. You mark out your 60-minute highs and lows. You wait for some shift in market structure that would be gravitating towards that old high or old low. Once you have a shift in market structure, using just what I taught in the 2022 model, you wait for a fair value gap. As soon as it trades into it, you engage. Half of the range from wherever you're getting in to that old high or old low, whether you're aiming for a bull move or bear move, matters not. As soon as it moves half of that range, half your trade comes off. Stop the break even. And you submit to whatever happens then. That's it. That's all you have to do. That is a complete model. Don't risk more than 1%. It might be five handles. It might be 20 handles. It might be 30 handles. How are you going to know the range between where you're trying to buy and where that old high or old low is? That fair value gap exists every day. Liquidity above old highs and old lows, below old lows rather, that's there every day. And you're complicating things. You're trying to bring all these things that I've taught hoping that they're all going to do what? Allow you to accept no losing trades and be right all the time. And being right is a poison to a new developing student. Your goal is consistency. You want to be doing the same things over and over again, using a model that delivers consistently. Doesn't mean it's 100%. It just means... Over a large sample size, what's that mean? 20. 20 trades. 20 trades, you're at about 70% one side. That's a good measuring stick. But what happens if I'm not 70? You keep working until you are. And then once you get to that point and you're 70% strike rate, how can that possibly be, Michael? Come on. That's too high. It's unrealistic. All the books say, I'm telling you, don't read into those books. Those books are written by authors that have sold a book. That's what they're doing. They're selling you a, a narrative, a plot. They probably don't even trade with what they're writing about. I walk into these live markets. Whether I'm sitting on Twitter tweeting out the very candles that we be looking for in the draw on liquidity. Bending time and space to precision, and you see your chart printing it later on. That's not hindsight. When I'm on the live sessions, I'm calling the minute candles, explaining what's going to happen, and giving you the narrative. This is what you're supposed to be doing for yourself. You create these little laboratory experiments, and you go in every day. Anytime you get a chance to study, that's what you do. And every time you record what you're feeling, how you felt. And the goal is for you to have indifference. You can't simply just write the word in your journal, I was indifferent to the outcome. You, you can't fake that part. You need to be observing where you're feeling these anxious moments where you feel like you're in troubled waters. They will materialize in the same places all the time until you cope with that. You replace it with a positive habit. What is that? When you feel it, you kill half the trade. If you can't cut it in half, you get it all off, done. And what that allows you to do is you reset mentally and emotionally that now, okay, I've paid myself. I've removed a great deal of the risk. I've profited from it. And now I have a free look. I got a free bus ride 
to get to my target if it wants to go there. But you don't you don't know and you're not going to know because you're now recuperating from what you just put yourself through, which was stress. If your trades are stressful, you're trading too big. Your risk is too much. The easiest solution to that, drop down in your leverage. I can get out there and I can find these five handle run these five handle runs, 20 handle runs, 15 handle runs, 30 handle runs. And I'm holding on to five contracts, 10 contracts because top step says I can do 15. So I'm trying to push the envelope. I got things to do, ICT. But it's hard for you to hold a trade. So I get out too early. What am I doing wrong? You're over leveraging. You're trading too big. You haven't given yourself time to grow up into five contracts, 10 contracts, let alone 15, what guarantees you're going to blow your account. That's what they want. I want you to trade with one contract. Look what I did with the TD Ameritrade account last year. I doubled the account trading one contract with lots of losing trades to showcase my students. I mocked up, draw down, put myself in situations they asked me to do. This is what I do. And this is where I fall victim to. How would I do that? I went in there and actually did it with real money. It took 25000 to over 50000 five and a half weeks, one contract. Now, $25,000 a month, that's probably good for most of you, even if you are doing well. And if you, if you could get just one quarter of that consistently, that can change your entire life. Imagine if your mortgage was paid, half your mortgage was paid, half your mortgage and a car note and insurance. That's a blessing. But much like trying to make those ends meet, some of you want to just be able to quit your job right now and get away from Carl and Bruce. And you're rushing it. And you're thinking that as long as I'm right, as long as I'm right, I'll get there quicker. And quicker is not the right thing. You got to be on time. It's the same goal you have when you go to work. You want to arrive on time in one piece, prepared to do your job. You can't rush success. You can't. It doesn't work that way. And placing so much emphasis on arriving sooner than what's realistic. Think about it. When I used to have to go to work in the morning time, I had pretty much a straight shot because I'd get up really, really early. Drive a 45-minute drive, 40-minute drive, in 20 minutes, speeding, admittedly. But I hated going home because I would be in rush hour traffic. Think about what you do to yourself sitting in traffic. You know damn well there's 150 frigging cars in front of the one in front of you. You know that. But your limited myopic perspective is this asshole's holding you up. So what are you doing? You're riding on his bumper or her bumper. Looking in the rear mirror. Yeah, look at me, bitch. Look at me so I can tell you you're so-and-so. What did you do? You lost the plot. You got emotional. You're demanding something. You can't move that wall of cars. And being angry about it doesn't move them faster for you. But yet here you are in your car, pissed off, cussing at everybody, ready to get out, swing your tire iron, and break somebody's windshield because it's holding you up. You're trying to get somewhere, and these people are doing this intentionally. They're holding you up, and they're thinking about the same thing to the person in front of them. And that's what traders are doing when they get in the marketplace. They want to get somewhere too quick in, in impossible conditions. You lose sight of what you're doing. You get out there trying to prove to the world that you're better than somebody else, and you wreck your ass. Turn your live streams off before they really end and go into a losing trade. You know it's you know it's all about. You know the score. They all have these problems. 
They're wrestling with it. You're wrestling with it. Because you're trying to do more than what's required. Follow the model. Follow the rules. Listen to the analyst in you. When it tells you you're in troubled waters, you do not flake out like you're in rush hour traffic thinking that you're going to be able to bully everyone out of your way. What do you do? Oh, you got all these good advice, ICT. What do I do when I'm stressing out in the car? Listen to ICT. <laughs> How about that? How about that? Because if you can listen to me, even if you don't like me, complain about me. Oh, bitch, you're a demo baller. We don't see you trading a live account in live. Go ahead. Put your attention there. I'm a therapy. Okay? Because if you're doing that, you won't get yourself in some kind of road raid event. And you'll probably get home safely. And you won't be worrying about the traffic. You'll be distracted. And that's what the process does for those individuals that when they get in troubled waters and they're in their market and their trade is causing them anxiety. As soon as you take half off or close, if you can't do any partial half, what you have done is you've distracted yourself. You've removed that need to be right. But I could be making less money if it goes to my target. Yeah, you could. But what are you gaining? Peace of mind. You're engaging with a now resumed approach to holding no hard line. It has to be my way. When you first put the trade on, you may have had a clear vision about what it is you're expecting to see in the chart, how you're going to ride it to that profit objective. But something changed. And you have to be sensitive to that. Allowing the analyst to speak to you through your conscience, say, okay, you know this is probably not going to pan out right now. So what we should do is take half of this off, roll to stop to break even if it's not already there. Or if you have it in a trail position, don't squeeze it anymore. Just leave it there. If it turns on you and stops you there, who cares? I show you that it happens with me. I'm doing that to teach you. I'm showing you that. I can get in the trades and do full pulls, and then just that's all I'm going to do. But I'm a practical teacher. I'm telling you how to grow into that state. You just can't do it right out of the box. You can't. Your mind won't let you. And the people that are highly opinionated about how this stuff doesn't work, I can't do it, you won't be able to do it, you're going to fail, they're not providing anything as an alternative with consistency. So why the fuck are you listening to them? You already have enough on your plate. You know what you're wrestling with. So turn off all of that static white noise and listen to your conscience. Your conscience is going to talk to you if you've been doing everything I'm telling you to do. It will guide you because of the experience you've placed in its hands. That analyst is going to guide you when it's troubled waters. But you have to let the analyst communicate to the trader in you, the one that's going to make the sound executions on the sound logic that comes from the analyst. The person that you're training with the back testing, the person that you're training to observe the opportunities in reading old data and watching real time price action and tape reading, and then the walk forwards. And then finally doing a demo. Demo, that's when the trader arrives. He or she has no function in any of this until you get to demo. So the trader in you should not be talking about, I want to buy here. I want to sell here. I would do that. Because that's not the trader talking. That's retail Rick. That's the gambler in you. So you've got three people inside of you right now that's going to be wrestling to be in the driver's seat. The analyst needs to be shotgun all the time. The analyst is right next to you all the time, and you're wanting to hear the logic that that 
part of you, when it's time for your conscience to say, okay, you're you're in a position that's probably not as good as we thought it was. Do not listen to jokers and clowns out there looking for clout that tell you, just got to have conviction for your trade. If you know that you're absolutely 100% uncomfortable and you are not able to focus on the trade, you are absolutely doing things backwards. And these same people, you never see them execute anything, not even recorded. They don't prove anything. They prove they have an opinion that nobody should listen to. There's this clout police force that's forming, and they're out there trying to keep your attention from learning how to do this. And you're seeing people now bring in real receipts with real money, and now they're uncomfortable because they don't have that. They don't have anybody proving that what they're doing or what they've done is making them any money. See, we're getting into the, the thick of things here now. The rubber's meeting the road. Come down to the brass tacks. And those that are submitting themselves properly are getting results. And all the old things that they used to be able to say about what we do here, they're finding that it's being met with a bulletproof vest. And it's wrecking ball proof. Atomic bomb proof. You can't beat proof with real money, with real receipts, with real interviews from companies that pay these individuals. I don't own any funded account, so I'm not scripting anything. <laughs> so they're doing something right. And that's the following of the process and the model. And you hear it in their own testimonies that they struggled, just like you're struggling too. But they kept pressing forward. I'm sure they saw all the things and hear all the things that all of you hear. You're never going to get it. This is becoming retail. This is never going to be retail. Look how many people talk bad about it. That right there is a testimony. <laughs> as long as we got all these people hating on the idea, it ain't never going to be. It ain't going to be retail. They want you to think that because they're insecure. They want you to feel like this is the worst thing for you to be doing. You should be following their garbage. Listen to their bullshit. Don't take partials. Trade animal patterns. <laughs> Gonna wet my whistle here. You're probably wondering why I'm so uh, low-key tonight. Usually I go off the rails a little bit faster. I'm actually uh, under some Benadryl. I had to take Benadryl. I had a little bit of a reaction. My wife made some some kind of chicken shit. She was mixing kinds of stuff. She got that fucking TikTok. I'm telling you, I've wasted so much money at the grocery store because of TikTok. This woman watches TikTok, and every recipe that comes out, my house has got to make it, and she's got to ask me all the time, "Taste this, taste this." And if she put something in there tonight. It caused me almost to not be able to do this. Kept coughing and coughing and coughing. So I had to take Benadryl. And I'm a little relaxed, almost to the point where I want to take a, a nap again. But I already took my two naps today. So that's our rabbit trail for this one. But you don't want to go into your trading constantly pursuing right. And you know already, most of you, doing that isn't getting you where you want to be. But you're wrestling, arm wrestling with the results of you trying to do that. You think, well, if I just do a little bit harder, I'll get through that because this is how trading is. No, that's how gambling is. Look at the people. If you had the opportunity to go, go to a casino. When I had my first year anniversary, we went to Atlantic City and we stayed at the Taj Mahal. And I only, literally only took $100 down to the casino. That's it. Because number one, it was my first time at the casino. I've never, never gambled like that. And I said, in, in the event that I would take more money than I should, and if I win, I'm afraid that I'm going to get 
compulsive about that and say, I'm going to try to do it again and do it with more and more and more. So I purposely left all credit card, all debit card. I don't even use a debit card, but I'm just telling you, there was no means for me to take any money out of my bank accounts. It's just, this is what I brought and other cash was for, you know, eating and whatever. And I sat at that one on bandit slot machine. And every time I would get down to the last $10, I just want to lose it because I don't want to have to do this anymore. And I didn't want to do what? Get up and walk away. The analyst in me <laughs> was saying, this is a waste of time. You're not going to make any money. And you're already just wanting to leave, but you're not wanting to get up because retail Rick is pulling the slot machine. But what happens if I get a jackpot? What happens if I win $2,000? The maximum thing I could have won on this was $2,000. And I would make it a little bit up to 75, 65, just under 80 bucks, getting back to oh, the $100 that I put in the machine. And then all of a sudden, it would be spent, 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 spent down to the last $10, $12. And I'm like, okay, it won't be much longer now. And then I won't have it. And I ain't got to worry about doing this. I can go, go watch the shows with my wife or whatever. And I'd win a little bit more, but it would be like, to be 50 bucks or 40 bucks. And then the gambler in me said, oh, I'm probably real close to one of those big wins. Let me just keep playing. And I sat down there for almost seven fucking hours with the same hundred bucks. Couldn't make it go away and I couldn't freaking make any money above hundred bucks. I never got it over a hundred dollars. So I'm thinking to myself, this is stupid. Like, what the hell am I doing? So finally, I just did the maximum bets that it would allow me to do. And then, boom, it's gone. And I was relieved that that $100 was spent like that. Because I was like, okay, now I don't have it. I won't be enticed to do what? Do another run of that and get caught up in that whole pursuit of being right. That's how I learned this. The whole discussion tonight was that moment in 2022. I'm sorry, 20. 02, 2002 is when we uh, went to Atlanta City. The, the, we got married Valentine's Day of 2001. And then a year later, we were in Atlanta City celebrating it there, which was weird because I've never been to a casino. And that's where she said she wanted to go. So whatever. But this whole idea of removing myself from that, I, I, I applied that experience to the trading when I start feeling like I'm listening to the wrong voice in my conscience that's telling me to be acting on impulsiveness, what if? See, the analyst isn't going to do, okay, um, what if you make more money than we thought? Or what if this is a, a trade that we hold on for a longer time? The analyst never is, is never doing that. The analyst is going to, Speak through your conscience to you and say, this is the rules, bub. This is what you're supposed to be doing. This is all you're supposed to be doing. And when you step out of line, I'm going to remind you because you, it's going to feel like uncomfortableness. And that's not just fear of making money or losing money. That sometimes is the analyst that's been increasing in its understanding about what it is that you're doing and the marketplace. Don't cancel that out. Don't arm wrestle that because it's sometimes the experienced analyst that you trained up to this point in your development. And it's going to be communicating to you through your conscience by saying, this is not what we should be doing. We should be doing this. And then what you're doing sometimes is you're allowing retail Rick, the gambler in you and the trader to argue with one another, ignoring the analyst, which is the sound advice that you should be following. So how do you deal with that? Your plan needs to be written out. When I take a trade, I have a notepad next to me. I'm literally writing down target, partial, partial, stop won't move until it gets to this price. That's it. So if I see something, some little flurry of price action comes in, vroom, if it doesn't break the rules that I have written down for my idea, 
I'm not moving my stop. I'm not panicking. But it might cause a concern for me to feel like the analyst is saying, okay, we now are in troubled waters. What's the process? Half off. Don't move the stop anymore. Or if it's not moved, the better to break even. Move the better to break even and then let it go. Submit to whatever happens. And that's how you condition yourself to not just run like a you know, cat with its tail between its legs, fearful, because that's what would be the outcome. You don't want to just run away from any trade. At some point, you have to press into it. But it's easier to press into that trade that's uncertain now when you've taken half off. You've made money. You had a part-time job in that trade, and you made money. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And any fucker out there that tells you there is, they're not showing you anything, but they're telling you this is the advice that you should follow, their shit. And they don't do anything to garner your respect or belief that what they're saying is sound logic. You don't see them signing into an account, going through day by day, this is what I made, this is what I lost. You don't see that, but they're highly opinionated. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to somebody that's going out there live on Twitter or in live streams and calling every fucking candle movement before it happens? Or are you listening to somebody that brings nothing but more confusion? If you're doing that, that's the same thing that you're going to experience in your trades. You're going to wrestle internally. It's going to be like chaff. You won't be able to focus. You'll feel like you have attention dis uh, deficit disorder when you really don't. You're just placing too much stress because you're over leveraging. You're demanding being right. Easiest solutions. Cut half the trade off. You'll fix the over leveraging right there. You funded yourself. You paid for that time in the trade. Your stop's better than even. And now you can submit to the outcome. I'm in a trade, ICT. I got this shit figured out. I'm in here. I got five contracts. I'm long s and I'm looking for a 20-handle run. Around 12 handles in. Whew. What are we doing here? Anybody got any ideas? What do you think? You think it's going to go up? Let's do a poll. As soon as you feel that, half off. But I got five contracts. Take three off. Why not two? Take three off. Shut the fuck up. Take three off. You've banked three. Let the two run. If it goes to stop, it's okay. If it goes to target, great. Next trade. You got to wrestle yourself into submission to the model. Otherwise, the market and your weaknesses will rest you, wrestle you into submission to failure. You won't see it coming. You'll never, nobody ever sees it coming until it's done. And you're like, oh, man, I, I knew at that moment, right? You'll know exactly what it was. And you'll know and you'll admit to yourself, that was the moment I should have did this or that. Damn it, why did I do that? Now I got to do a uh, funded account reset. Now I got to go put more money in the account. And it will repeat all the time until you do the things I'm telling you to do here. You're trying to graduate to a state of mind that when you go into the marketplace, you are at the state of mind that is when being right is no longer enough. You now are detail-oriented. You're principle-oriented. You're following logic. You want precision. Right is not enough. Your pursuit now is you want to control risk so impeccably 
that your winners are going to so far outpace your losing trades, it won't matter. It won't matter. The next tr trade that you lose on, it won't even have any impact at all on you. None. Zero. People might talk about it in passing. Oh, yeah, you got to let your profits run, trade your plan, plan your trade. It all sounds great. But how do they engage? Do they trade recklessly? Are you trading recklessly? Are you throwing everything out the window because now you have a funded account or a live account? The things that you were doing in your demo that were consistent, the only thing that's changing when you go into live funds, because it's still live data you're trading off of, the only thing that's changed is now you have potential reward and potential loss. And you have to grow into accepting that. And it's not easy. For some of you, it's going to be next to impossible. But you have to graduate into it slowly. Whatever the least amount of money you can put in on a trade, that lot size, that's what you trade. Until you're absolutely bored. And then you go up one more contract. Trade like that until you're absolutely bored. And you do it again and keep doing it again and again until you can get to the point where, oh, wow, you know, I can be in five mini contracts making 250 bucks per handle. All I got to do is get four handles and it's $1,000. And you'll see that making $1,000 a day doing that is easy. But you know it's hard for you right now because you're going to feel what? As soon as you put a trade on with five contracts, you're thinking, shit, my ass is puckering. What is going on? Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to hold this or get out. It's moved two ticks. Shit, it just moved two ticks. What am I going to do? Two ticks. Am I long or short? What the hell am I doing here? Did I put the stop on right? You're going to be thinking about all kinds of shit. You're going to feel completely, completely like a noob. What's changed? Potential reward and potential profit is the greed. Potential loss, potential debit to your account. That's your potential wreckage. Now, instead of saying, okay, is price confirming that it's continuously moving in my favor? And is order flow still on my favor in my in my own side? That's where your attention is. You're not looking at the profit and loss little button on your screen. How much money am I up and down, up and down? You do that, you're, you're done. I just do that to show you eye candy to hold your attention in the early stages. You don't need to see that once you understand what you're doing because you can clearly see, okay, it's moved in your favor. Do the math. How many contracts could you have been there? And there it is. In the beginning, new Traders, new students, they need to be entertained. There's got to be a hook in their mouth that draw them this direction. And I'm a master at that. Good songs, maybe not every song, because I'm sure some of you would have heard songs that I put in my videos where like, what the hell is he thinking putting this in there? It's not, it's not for you, it's for me. <laughs> but I know how to draw a crowd. And once that crowd's there, I know how to teach you. But I also am aware that some of you are not teachable and you'll walk away before you should. And some of you, I'm glad you did or do because you're not prepared and you're just going to be toxic. But knowing what to do, when to react to it. When we react, okay, I saw this, uh, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. He's a YouTuber. He tweeted, your job as a trader is not to predict the future. It's to react to price. What the fuck kind of logic is that? Like that literally encapsulates retail trading right there. That's it. That's it. That is retail trading in a sentence. What you're saying 
by saying something like that, or if your thoughts are in alignment with that, what you're essentially saying is there's no way to know where price is likely to go. So fuck it. Let's gamble. That's exactly what you're saying. Um, your job is not to try to predict price. Your job as a trader is to react to price. Get the fuck out of here. Listen, if you don't know where the draw on liquidity is, where the market's likely to be going up or down to, you're clueless. You have no business, zero business, pushing a button in that, re in that regard. You don't have any business doing any kind of trading because you're literally putting a blindfold on, being spun around 50 times in the dark, stopped. It's okay. Take this tack, walk forward, and pin the donkey, you know, pin the tail on the donkey game. But you're, you're doing it disoriented. And you're reacting. What are you going to react to? When your hand hits the wall, okay, push the thumbtack in. Let's see what happens. Bullshit is what happens. These individuals that hold that logic, that's the reason why they struggle. And they have hit and miss results once in a while. And what keeps them in the game? Risk management. They suck at trading. Their trades are just, just terrible. The logic to get into the trade is lacking. But what keeps them in the game? Money management. But I'm a professional trader. I make my money from trading. Okay. Imagine if you learned how to determine where price is going. And you kept everything else the way it is. How much better would you be? I'm interested in seeing that. But you have to know. What we're doing is predicting price. We're predicting it. We're time fucking traveling, okay? We're literally moonwalking into the future, gaining insight and coming right back to where we are right then and sitting in front of the charts. What does that mean? It's impossible. Now he's talking out of your ass. Okay, well, listen, when you're looking at the charts, when you're looking at the charts, you need to be able to see in your mind's eye, can you physically see the price running up to that relative equal high? If you can see it, that's the first step. You have to be able to see that that potentially is in the chart. It could manifest itself. Now, how it finally gravitates to there, does it go in one straight shot or is there two price legs into it, maybe three price legs before it gets there? That's not important. You're submitting to the idea that you are seeing this present price action. It's likely to go up to those relative equal highs where there's buy side liquidity. So you're submitting yourself to what I'm, a, I'm in a buy program. I'm going to be buying discount arrays. I'm going to be observing price and looking to see if down close candles support price and repel it higher. To the left of all that, if there is a range in price action, I want to see up close candles being traded through. That's institutional order flow being bullish. You don't need a depth of market. You don't need moving averages. You don't need any of that shit. The chart will tell you everything you need to know. But you're not you're not reacting to any fucking thing except for that internal voice that tells you you're in troubled waters. So that's the only time you're getting permission from ICT to react to any fucking thing. You're reacting to your conscience. Your conscience is talking to you saying, hey, um, this is probably not a good idea now uh, because you're not listening to me. And you and the gambler are arguing with one another. And I'm trying to guide us through this trade. And you are causing a decoupling. And now it's going to be physically felt with fear of missing out on the move, fear of being stopped out disorientation there's going to be a day i promise you this whether you've ever had an anxiety attack or not this is going to happen to you there's going to be a time when you have a funded account or you have real money at risk and you're in a trade out of nowhere your heart's going to start beating a little bit too fast 
you're going to start hyperventilating. You won't really notice it until it starts. But then you're going to feel anxious. You may feel like you want to throw up. Feel like you need to go to the bathroom. You're going to lose control of yourself. Or pass out. Feel like you can't breathe. Feels like you're not getting air, but you're hyperventilating and breathing too much. Start seeing stars. Feel like you're going to faint. Feels like the whole world is now laying on your back. And you're in a trade while all that's going on. That's an anxiety attack. That's usually when the analyst is saying, listen, it's it. Like we're doing everything now to get your attention. So what should you be doing? Reacting. You need to react to that. But you need to be predicting the future and price. That's what we do as traders. Anybody, and I've seen this multiple times with other educators and such. Anytime someone tells you your job as a trader is not to predict the price, get the fuck away from that person. That person doesn't know shit. They know nothing. They absolutely know nothing. They're leading you down the primrose lane. They're full of shit. They can't do it, and they're just trying to justify their own ignorance, period. That's the way it is. Someone in this industry tells you your job is not to try to predict the price. What the fuck are you doing if you're not doing that? How are you not trying to predict the future. If you're bullish, what does that mean? That means you're a buyer. So you're what? You're predicting that price is going to go fucking up. What kind of shit is that? Your job is not to try to predict the future, but to react to price. No, 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 no. We are predicting where price is going to go. We are anticipating that prices are going to go to a discount when we're bullish, we're going exactly where the fuck we're trying to buy. We know exactly where our fucking stop loss is going to be. We know exactly why the fuck we're expecting it to go up. We are not reacting to shit. Period. That's just the fucking way it is. That's the reality. That's trading. That's the real shit. That's in the trenches. Real fucking trading. Any fucking body that tells you anything apart from that, you unfollow. You fucking tell them to go fuck themselves and stop spreading misinformation. That's how you handle that shit. Period. That really fucking gets under my fucking skin, man. Like, I, I don't like that. Because that's ignorance. That's fucking class A fucking ignorance. Masquerading as fucking wisdom. Get the fuck out of here, man. That's fucking Sesame Street fucking wisdom. React to price. Get the fuck out of here. And you're probably listening to this, so do fucking better. But you have to know, you have to know when that conscious is talking to you. And if you feel unsettled, you feel uncomfortable while you're in that trade, that's the surest time signal to you that you need to react to that as I need to bail on half the trade and just kill it. And if you can't, tilt, take the whole trade off. I promise you in the first few times that you do it, it'll feel like, especially if it runs further, it'll feel like that's the worst advice you ever received. But I promise you, it will serve you better than anything else because it takes so much more for the human mind to go through that stressful en endeavor of holding through that shit. When you're new, you don't have any, you don't have any experience. You have none. You're going through it. So yes, at some point you will have to submit to it. But initially when you're developing, when you first get that first experience, you do not dig your heels in and say, I'm holding on for dear life. You master yourself. You reward yourself. You've taken the risk up to that moment. You've submitted to the trade idea up to that moment. But something is occurring, and you don't know. I don't know if it's your experience that you've now gained that's trying to commu communicate to you through your content saying, okay, this is no longer a viable setup. You don't know that yet. So the first instances of this occurring 
in your development and you're in a live trade where you have real money at risk, you take half the trade off. I promise you that's the best advice that you're going to get regarding that moment, that, that instance of where you're in there and you feel like you're completely out of control. You can't focus. You can't come to the decision of get in. You know, I'm not getting in, but stay in the trade or get out. If you're in that, that arm wrestling match ever, and it's a live account trade when there's real money, and you are wrestling with, should I get in? Or I'm sorry, should I get out of the trade or should I hold on to it? If you are completely wrestling with that and you can't even focus on what price is doing right now, you're being distracted by that. So you won't be able to watch order flow. You won't be able to receive the information that price is going to tell you because you're watching the likelihood of you being right slip out from your hands. And that pursuit of being right overtakes the logic that puts you into the trade or would keep you in the trade. It doesn't feel clear at the time. You feel like you're losing your mind. And if you're in a panic attack or an anxiety attack while it's going on, it makes it worse. But I promise you, 10 minutes after you close the trade or take half off, it goes away. You'll see things a little bit clearer. If you're in panic, if you're disoriented in a trade and you start worrying about whether you should stay in or get out, half the trade comes off. Walk away, minimum 10 minutes. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. If it comes back and hits your stop, who cares? You're comfortable with that. If it goes to target, who cares? You were expecting that anyway. But 10 minutes. Because what happens is, if you remove yourself from the stimulation that causes the anxious moment and would have thinking, you've now immediately reacted to the emergency that your mind's saying that you're in, when there really isn't. There is no emergency. But you don't realize that at the time. So the master yourself and your emotions and the psychological warfare that you're putting yourself through is you take half the trade off, make sure the stops at better than break even, and you submit to the rest of the move. Whatever happens, happens. But you must walk away, leave the room where your charts are, minimum 10 minutes. It's going to feel like you want to rush back in there and just peek and see what's going on. Don't. Do something else. Take a walk. Go grab something to drink. Stretch out. Let 10 minutes pass. All of the adrenaline, the cortisol, all those hormones that your body's releasing, they'll burn off in 10 minutes. If you do something other than what you were doing, which is standing still like a Ferrari in park, but with the acceleration pedal down to the floor, you're, gonna, you're, you're tearing the engine up. It's not meant to do that. And the only thing you're going to do is keep that panic attack going until you're probably going to get sick, pass out, or feel like you're dying and call an ambulance for nothing. And between the time you call the ambulance because you feel like you're dying and you're having chest palpitations, tightness in your chest, tingling down your arm. I would always get this tingling in the corner of my left, uh, like the corner of my left side of my mouth. It would start tingling, and it would be like this numbless tingling feeling that goes right up, like a like you were drawing a, a smiley face on the right side of my mouth from the corner up to my left eye corner. It would be in like a pathway of numbness right there. And all that was was adrenaline. Because I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting there looking at my charts. What if this? And what if that? And what if this? And what if that? And I'm basically scaring myself. And I'm releasing adrenaline. But sitting still, doing nothing to burn it off. Your brain says there's an emergency. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Let's get it on or let's get the hell out of here. And what am I doing? Sitting still. Looking at something that I'm constantly telling myself there's an emergency. I need to make a reaction and decision. What are we doing? And I'm doing nothing. I'm what if thinking, what if thinking, and what if thinking. And then finally, cortisol, that hormone's released in my bloodstream. And now I start feeling physical symptoms, chest tightness. I'm breathing faster because my brain's been told there's an emergency right now and I've released adrenaline. Now my heart races faster and cortisol. 
is a stress hormone that once it hits your body, you're completely in a different state of mind. You will start feeling physical symptoms. Palms will be sweaty. You'll start maybe trembling. Dizziness because you've blew off all your CO2, but it feels like you're not getting oxygen, but you're just too low on CO2. You blew it off. The exhaling, too much. You ever see the people breathe into a paper bag? What that does is it helps regulate your blood, uh, blood oxygen level with the CO2, so it's balanced. You have to slow your breathing down. Take your attention on something else. And I mentioned over the summer last year, I said the way you beat a panic attack is have a sleep second hand on your watch. And you feel your pulse and you watch the sleep second hand and you count. And what you're doing is you're taking your attention away from the things that you're scaring yourself with. And that's how you do it. You take the trade off halfway or close it and you remove your attention from the charts. Physically leave the room for 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, you'll feel silly and you'll start, you'll probably start laughing like, what the hell did I just scare myself with? There's no emergency. There is no emergency. But you can trick yourself into thinking there is. And if your mind's racing like that, can you really follow your model? No. No one can. It's impossible. Zero possibility. And so many times traders fall into this condition multiple times in their career. But the first time it happens, it is scary as shit. Like you're afraid you're going to pass out. And what happens then? My most of my trade just keeps coming back and not um, and stops me out. You stopped out. What the fuck are you worried about? Like I used to have panic attacks and think to myself, wow, if I'm in a restaurant and say I start choking and then I get the food caught in my throat. And then finally, I end up vomiting in front of everybody. How embarrassing would that be? Well, how about, you know, what if it doesn't happen and I enjoy my meal? <laughs> what the fuck? That's, it, that's what the human mind does, though. It reaches for the negative all the time. And people that are toxic, they live their, their themselves outwardly like that. Constantly looking for something to dramatize. Constantly looking for something to criticize. They're miserable people. And the, the folks that don't do that outwardly tend to do it inwardly, and then they punish themselves with anxious feelings of emotion that are unbridled. And you lose thought, control, mastery of yourself. And now you're not watching the market. You're not even worrying about being stopped out. You're not worried about making the money. You're wondering now, am I dying? Am I having a heart attack? Am I having a stroke? Because you've lost all focus. That's how all these things happen. That's the that's the the road and pathway that leads right to that. Some of you may never have that experience. It'll be far and few between. But most of you will have this. If you're trading with real money, it will happen. You will have an anxiety attack. You will feel like you're literally having a heart attack or stroke. And you're doing it to yourself. You're scaring yourself. Cut half the trade off. Stop better than break the even. And let it happen. Whatever's going to happen is happening. But walk away from the charts. The stop's there to do its job. The limit order will be there to get you out. Stop looking at it. And give 10 minutes for your body to regulate all the hormones. For some of you young guys or gals that never had that experience yet, <clears throat> you'll have a you'll have a panic attack. It's it's just a high level of stress. You may not ever want to submit to it and call it a panic attack. It's just an anxious moment. But if you have racing thoughts and physical symptoms of wanting to pass out or stroke or tingliness up and down your arm or whatever, that's a drone. And you're sitting still. The easiest thing to do is just take a quick walk, burn it off, exercise, do some kind of you know, physical exertion to, to burn that stuff off. 
and constantly tell yourself there is no emergency and everything's fine. And you self-talk yourself down from that, which is the reason why I teach you to self-talk in your journal. Don't invite that negative stuff because if you bring the negative stuff in there, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm pursuing right. And right is not the goal here. Consistently profitable. And if you're only framing that in the context of right only, you're going to take trades that are going to be outside the parameters that your model is because you're thinking, oh, this is one of those times where it's going to move and it's outside the kill zone. And, you know, this is, I got time. I just think it's going to go up there and maybe just get in there and push the button. And you know damn well doing it. You're doing everything wrong. So you're not going to be in there low stress. You're going to have a panic attack worrying about it. And you're not even going to trade it right. You're going to submit to the first 20 seconds of it and you're going to be counting every minor fluctuation that goes against you, thinking that it's going to be the next tick before it runs 20 handles against you in one shot, one straight shot. Boom. You're stopped out. Not just a little bit stopped out. You're way stopped out. <laughs> That's what your mind does to you. It tricks you. And if you trade like that, it's because you're over leveraging too much risk or you're trading outside your model and you know it. And subconsciously, your analyst in you is saying you're doing things wrong and retail Rick's driving. You've put the analyst in the back seat or left them at home and you're shotgun with retail Rick and he's had too much to drink. It's not going to be a good outcome. <laughs> So your conscious will talk to you. And as you get more experience, as you get better at this and you have more wisdom because you've been doing it longer, that voice will be a lot more comforting and it'll guide you. And that's the thing that when you're asking me as students, how do you trust and how do you know that the market was going to reverse like that? How do you know like, that it's not going to go past that low? It's experience. The analyst is in me saying, these are those instances where it does this. You've seen this before. So here's what we do. This is what we don't do. This is what we expect to see. That is what? Predicting. It's not reacting. It's predicting. The trader anticipates. The analyst predicts. The gambler sits in the back seat and shuts the fuck up. We don't want to listen to the gambler. We're not giving the wheel to the gambler, but they're always going to be chatting. Yeah, but we could have bought more. You should have hold longer. This one did better than that one. You bought the wrong pair. Shut the fuck up, Rick. It's hard to filter that out. The, the part of you that is always going to look for what you didn't do right. Because retail Rick is constantly looking through the lens of right. You should not have that in your trading at all. But you're going to have it as an internal wrestling match always. Because you're going to criticize yourself. And there's never going to be a bigger critical person on this planet than you are. Nobody could troll ICT harder than I troll myself. When I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I live that shit for years. Maybe it's not that way for you, but it's human nature for us to be judgmental with ourselves. And sometimes with mental illnesses, it can manifest itself in very toxic ways, either inwardly or outwardly. So it's important that you constantly be reminded that we're not pursuing being right, okay? It, it really is impactful when you go into your trading day giving yourself permission to not be perfect. If you're wrong, it doesn't mean that it's a failure. It just means you're wrong. And you can be wrong and make money. That's what a sound model does. How, how can you be wrong? How can you be wrong 
and make money. Partials. They work every fucking time. There has never been a partial that was taken in a trade that did not yield a gain or profit. It cannot happen. A partial profit is profitable. And you take that when it offers it to you. Then, if the trade doesn't go to your targets or target final terminus and stops you out on the balance, guess what that means? You were wrong, but you made money. Books don't teach that mindset. Educators don't teach that mindset. They've been doing it since I've been talking about it, but I don't mind being a trailblazer. That's why I'm here after all. Blazing trails for you all to ramble on behind me and then find your own trailblazing. But you have to know what you're doing. You got to know how to predict price. You have to know how to predict the future. I've said it many times, folks. It's in the name of what we're doing. We're trading futures. We're dealing with the future. Everything about what we're doing is predicting the future. <laughs> but when you don't understand how to predict with a great deal of consistency what the future is likely to do, then I guess it makes sense for someone to have the mindset that your job is not to predict the future because we don't know how to do that. So therefore, let us relinquish the pursuit of anything like that and just adopt the alternative, which is let's just react. Let's react to it. Like a knee-jerk response when your doctor takes that little rubber triangle hammer and taps you on your kneecap and your leg involuntarily just kicks up. Every time I went and got a physical, I used to always try to force myself, I'm not going to move, I'm not going to move, Boop, and my leg would jump. I'd be mad. I don't want to react to certain things. And unfortunately, because I'm bipolar, many times I'll react to shit that I don't realize I'm reacting to until I'm already revved up. And nobody can talk me out of it. They can't talk me down. It's just got to do its thing. But in trading, it's the only thing in my life that has been a means of talking engaging and being able to be the closest thing to normal that I can imagine as someone as a bipolar person. It's very difficult for me to stay balanced for a long period of time. And if I'm watching price action, all of my focus, all of my attention is on these fluctuations inside these candlesticks. And if I'm talking and providing a narrative, in my mind, when I'm doing the live stream, like the live sessions, I'm talking to you about it, I'm literally talking out loud the things that I'm thinking. Like that's what that's exactly what it's like in my head. Look at the Twitter spaces. I, I don't shut the fuck up, except for catching in my breath once in a while. That's what it's like in my head. Nonstop, every waking conscious moment, my mind is constantly, constantly going. There's never a, a, a period of quietness unless I'm meditating and I'm only able to wrestle with three or four things then, not 500 of them all at one time. So price allows me that beautiful distraction and my attention is there. And I'm literally talking to myself internally the very way you hear me talking over the charts when I'm doing the live streams. I'm just saying it vocally. I'm, 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 I'm audibly making it come out of my mouth whereas it's just in my head i'm saying everything just like that non-stop i'm looking for this to do this i want this price to be here i don't want it to go past this candle here it can touch that that is reading the tape that's why i call it that you don't need a depth of market that's not reading the tape that's looking at a gimmick i'm looking at price i'm reading price i'm reading the minds of everybody out there looking at that same chart like Dr. Xavier, <laughs> he goes in there and puts his little helmet on. He can get out there and get in everybody's head. That's what ICT is doing. When he's watching his one-minute candles, I'm in all your heads. I'm the ghost in the machine. I'm in there hijacking shit. 
I'm in there overriding retail logic and being on the other side of what they're trying to do. I know what they're thinking when they're thinking it. I know where they're placing their stops. I know why they're going to move their stops, when they're going to move their stops, what they're hoping to see in terms of where price is going to go. As much as they they, they don't want to say they're trying to predict price, they may not say it in the circles they hang around in, but they're trying to predict price. And I know what they want to see in price. And when I see what I know is likely to happen, and it's wrestling with that logic that they're holding on to, hoping with gimmicks and bullshit, I have a high probability trade. That's the ones I tweet. That's why they work. The things I tweet, those instances are exactly the very moment when retail logic is arm wrestling what I teach you. And it's losing. My shit works. That's why the things I tweet pan out. I don't just go out and tweet whatever comes to mind. I'm waiting for that moment where I have most of the things I like to see in my favor. And then it goes to script. Before I started this Twitter space, I sent a link out. I said, go watch the Wednesday live stream. Go to the three hour, five minute and 30 second mark. And you'll hear me outline where I was saying, you know, people ask, why don't you uh, explain to us what makes you see a trade or when a trade isn't good for you? What, like, how do you differentiate something that's in the charts? Like, how do you know when a trade's really there? What are you looking for? Well, again, it gets back to experience. You, you can't, well, think about what you know now. Do that for a second. Think about what you understand about fair value gaps and 2022 model, how price goes to old lows for liquidity and above old highs for liquidity and time of day when certain things form. You didn't know that shit months ago. Look how much more you understand now. Now try to think about how you that didn't know what you know right now, how could you understand yourself explaining your present understanding to how you didn't understand it then. That's the predicament I'm in as a mentor. You need to experience it. You need to see it. And knowing yourself, because you're the same person back then and here, right now, which you have more understanding, you know that no amount of talking, no amount of jawboning about what it is and what it isn't, your ignorant self, before you've learned how to do what you've known now, would never appreciate anything. Even if you yourself went back from the fucking future, you would be like, what the hell are you talking about? Because you weren't there day after day, week after week, for now, a couple months now, seeing it explained before it happens. You can't take that experience and articulate it. Words aren't going to reach far enough. It's because you have experience. So that's what I mean when I say, when certain questions are asked, how do you, how do you this? And how do you do that experience 30 years? And you're getting that experience every time that we spend time together. When you're looking at your own chart studying, you're getting that experience. You don't realize it. It feels so infant, uh, not infant, but it feels so insignificant right now because it's early in your development. You know, every time a baby tries to start to stand up, it hasn't, been able to even stand on its own yet, but it tries to stand up and it falls over. Every little time it does that, it's incremental experience. And finally, one day you come home from work and your kid can walk around. It just happens like that, but it didn't just get up out of the womb and start running around. It's incremental. But you have to have patience. But you're not going to learn it fast. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. But the best way of doing it is seeing me explain it real time. And there is no gaming of TradingView when you're calling it real time every minute. Sorry. When you record your trades, entry, placement, management, th there is no gaming that. It's what it is. The last two days, even though I wasn't with you all, uh, early in the morning before the morning session because I was running around in the banks and such. Um, I spent time with my older students and I was calling the market with them and they watched you know, the markets pan out to script there too. 
I mean, they, they're used to it. I mean, when I used to teach every single day for them, they would see those types of things on a daily chart, an hourly chart, and 15 minute chart, and five minute chart. You all have been conditioned to expect that now from these concepts because I've been doing it with you all since last year. In November, all that stuff stops, and you'll have to depend on your own time and energy put into this. But by then, you'll know what you're supposed to be doing. You'll know what to go in and practice your drills with. And I practice still. I know how to do this, but I still practice. I take myself into events like non-farm payroll and I study, where do I think that the liquidity is for this? On the CPI number, I told you the, the boundaries of how far that we're going to reach for, for liquidity for CPI. And it dropped like immediate right down to the sell side. Went one tick into the level beyond it, lower, and then right on up. Pretty neat. That's the game I like to play with price action. When I know I don't want to trade it, I want to see how will my algorithm reach for price action? Where is it going to reach for? Where's the liquidity at? And when you see it like that, it's just it's just a fingerprint. That's all. That's all I'm showing you is that these things repeat because it's coded. It's written this way. And you see enough of it now to know that it's beyond coincidence. And it's something that you can do yourself. You can wait for these instances to you know, see price do certain things to tip its hand to you. And you wait, just like smart money does. It waits for the market to tip its hand. It's not waiting for patterns to form. It's not waiting for you know indicators and averages, the crossover. All that stuff is the opposite of what you're supposed to be looking at. You're waiting for a certain time of day, day of week, economic calendar, operating times, New York session, morning, New York session, afternoon, London session. And you're waiting for the market to tip its hand on where it wants to go. That's the draw on liquidity. But every single day, folks, listen, every single day, the market gravitates to buy side liquidity or sell side liquidity. And before it gets there, there is a fair value gap. That's always there. It's always there, folks. It's never going to be hidden from you. They're never going to fucking change the algorithm and remove that. <laughs> okay. It's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. There's always going to be people out there placing stop loss orders to get in or to get out of a trade. That's that's liquidity. That's necessary. That's fundamental to how markets are booked. You need a, another counterparty. And thankfully, just like Pete T. Barnum said, you know, there's a sucker born every two seconds. So it may not have been two seconds, maybe every minute. But the point is, there's suckers born all the time that want to come in here with their retail bullshit, harmonic patterns. Elliott Wave horse shit, yin and yangs on their chart. All that stuff is a reason for them to do what? Push a button. That's it. That's the instigation, the, the, the cause for them to do it. And the effect of that, that result, sometimes is lacking. You have been conditioned to anticipate precision. That's where your pursuit is. You're not trying to be someone that pursues being right because at some point being right is going to no longer be enough so what do you do to satisfy when you're right more times than you're not how you how do you stay status, satisfied you pursue excellence excellence in execution excellence in precision excellence in managing risk you refine your craft to be razor sharp, always at the ready, dialed in. That is the pursuit. That is not, I got to be right. I got to be right. When you do everything correctly through your model, the output that you get from that will be easily 
referred to in hindsight as you did that right. Notice the difference there? You're pursuing something else as the goal. But by doing that, you get what it is that you're trying to do initially as a new trader given to you. You get it as the result. But your pursuit is not to be right. Your pursuit is to follow the model, the logic, the plan, price action, studying what it is that you're doing and waiting for any kind of input through your watching of price or the experience factor that the analyst is going to come welling up inside of you, speaking to you through your conscience saying, okay, we're in troubled waters. Okay. I'm feeling a little disoriented right now. I feel that this trade is questionable now. So I'm not going to sit here and waste any time, develop a panic attack. I'm not going to waste mental capital because there might be another opportunity. And if you're bogged down with this, you won't be able to see it. So how do you do it? Half trade off. And if I can't do half, kill it. Done. Spend 10 minutes doing something else. How hard is that? It's going to feel impossible when you're in it. But you got to remember this lecture now. This is it. This is the standard operating procedure. This is your SOP when the shit hits the fan and you are now in troubled waters and you have lost the plot about the trade. You don't even know what you're supposed to be doing. The stop loss is a problem. The target's a problem. Holding is a, tar uh, is a problem. You don't want to get out. You don't know what to do. You're like a sailboat out in, in the ocean with no rudder. Wherever the wind takes you. And that could be scary. And it's justified for you if you lose sight of what it is you're doing and you're disoriented for you to feel that way. So the way you gain control, remove risk, half the position, take it off, and leave the charts. Minimum 10 minutes. And I promise you, you'll be able to walk back with a fresh perspective and you're not, not going to be disoriented. And you might see something in the chart that says, you know what? Everything's okay. And if you get another fair value gap or something else that gets you in to add another partial, you can put back on the part that you just took off. Now, see what I just walked you through? I walked you through how to manage yourself psychologically and emotionally in a time when you will experience this with real money. I promise you, you trade long enough, you're going to have this occur in your trades. The problem is, if you have it frequently occurring or manifesting, you are over leveraging. That's the clearest indication that you're using too much size. If it's hard for you to hold a trade and you're questioning whether you should get out, that is always a factor with over leveraging. So dial it back. Go down one size less. And if you still feel that way, go down one size less until you find that sweet spot. In that sweet spot where you put a trade on, you don't care. It might be two contracts for ES. It might be just one. And you can build a career on just that. You don't need to build it bigger than that. But once you understand how to pyramid, you can start with one contract. And every time it gives you an opportunity to enter, but not so close to your original entry, that it's makes it difficult you can like for instance say you want to sell short the es you sell short at four thousand hypothetically and it drops down it pulls back into a fair value gap that's still bearish at 39.96 okay you can sell short one more there it breaks down goes into 87 comes back up to 90 into a fair value gap or a bearish breaker you can add one more there. You're still trading one contract, but every one of these new pyramid entries is a trade in and of itself. And you gradually build up that way, but you're still a one contract trader. You're just adding more incrementally one contract at a time. That's called pillaring. Where you're just adding one to the original position, one, whereas a pyramid is you put your biggest position on first, reduce it. Your next entry would be on that. And then reduce that size and then take the next trade. 
that's a pyramid. That's how I, you see me do six contracts, three contracts, one, and I'm at 10 lot. That's my, that's like my bread and butter go-to. That's the thing I'm reaching for. That's why 99% of the trade executions, you see me doing that. It, is it advantageous to do it any other way? It's just something I, that's my, that's just me. I can do less. I can do more. This is, that's, I like to have 500 hours per point and 10 contracts on mini will get you there. But you can go in scaling in with six, three, and then one. And every time I'm adding, I'm adding less while there's profit behind that one. So even if it moves against me, it's not a huge compounded loss. And to understand what I'm saying is if you just go look at my examples that I have on Twitter and the few I have on my YouTube channel, when I'm showing you pyramided position building, that is based on i already have equity in trade and i'm not going to risk that equity to a point where it's going to make me a, a a larger loss if it goes against me once i have my full position on but you'll learn all that stuff we'll we'll be doing all that stuff in the summertime teaching you how to build pyramids and scaling in and stuff like that but i'm not sure where i got this idea it kind of like it was on a whim tonight to talk about all this and i hope it was helpful to you you know maybe if not anything else maybe it was a little bit entertaining but the the things i mentioned in here are real world experiences i went through it myself and as a 20 year old you you tend to think that you know everything when you don't know shit and i had that moment before whereas i know a little bit more than the average bear now but then I really believed I knew everything. <laughs> I didn't know anything. So when I got these points of panic, because I readily recognized that I was in over my head, I was doing trades that I shouldn't have been taking, taking and building up as big as I was doing it. And I wrestled with the whole, the whole time I was in the trade. And I couldn't tell you what the price was, even though I was looking at the chart. That's how disoriented I was. And that can happen to you if you're over leveraging. You lose completely every frame of focus, all sound logic, everything completely. It's like you're drunk. And I've never been drunk in my life. But that's what it felt like you know, looking back and thinking about it. like I was not in the right state of mind. I had no idea what I was doing. And if anybody was to sit down and, and you know, grab me by my arm and say, hey, Michael, listen, this is, you need to get out of trade, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take the advice. Like I was completely underwater, drowning, but foolishly keeping my head under the water myself. And that's what you do when you blow your account. You do that. Or it's gambler's numbness where you just sit there and you press the button. Remember the analogy I used when I went to my first year wedding anniversary and I was trying just to lose the hundred dollars. I just wanted to lose it to be done with it. I could have just said, you know what? You know, I lost 80 bucks, 90 bucks. I'll put the $10 in my pocket and I'll just grab an ice cream or something with my wife. And there it is. That would have been a better decision, but it doesn't feel like a better decision when you're there because now you're pursuing something and you don't want your pursuit to be about being right. So hopefully you found something useful in this one tonight. Hopefully I've uh, given you something to work with in terms of managing the psychological demands that we place on ourselves as, as traders and when we end up in these deep waters. And so I'll talk to you next time. I won't be doing a Twitter space tomorrow, obviously. I did one here tonight. I'm going to enjoy my weekend with my kids and my wife. And I'll be back at it again next Monday, Lord willing, until I talk to you then. Enjoy your weekend. Be safe.